his company, enjoy you on this Sunday, Lord, a day that you have made, and we want to rejoice and be glad in it, Father. We do come into your house, Lord, with praise and with singing. Father, as we worship you, I just pray that you inhabit our praises, that it would be a sweet sound to your ear and bring a smile to your face. I just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. no rock, there is no God like our God, no other name worthy of all our praise, the rock of salvation that cannot be moved, he's proven himself to be faithful and true, there is no rock, there is no God like ours, there is no rock, there is no God like our God, no other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved, he's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like ours. Rock of no God like us. Let's do that again. There is no rock. There is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. No God, there is no God like ours. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. There is no rock. No God like us. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. Rock of ages, Jesus is the rock. There is no rock. There is no God like ours. There is no rock. There is no God like ours. There is no rock. There is no God like ours. Rock of Father, we stand before the rock of ages. Thank you for being that. Thank you for being our solid rock, a rock that we can run to, a rock that we can cling to, a rock that just never, ever fails. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And you may be seated. Amen.
Father God, I thank you that uh, we're once again in your house today, Lord. I just thank you for just everybody that's here. Father, I just lift up those who couldn't be here today, Lord. Just uh, lift up Dick to you, Father, at home. Lord, just uh, continue to keep him safe as it leads up to his surgery, Father, and uh, just, just be with him and Linda, Lord, just all the dynamics through this, Lord. And just we lift up those who are just not feeling well today. Lord, I just continue to pray for Millie, Lord, that she continues to recover. And God, I just, again, Lord, I just thank you that uh, we have this privilege, Lord, that to meet in your home, Lord, as a family. We just pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And does anybody have anything they'd love? So, again, this week, um, you know, we just thank everybody for being here. We thank everybody who's watching online and uh, continuing to give online. We do have our little offering box there in the back. So if uh, anybody brought their checks or something today, they can just drop them in there. So, again, our church is still healthy spiritually and we're doing well so thank you everybody again for your ties and offerings and if somebody needs prayer for your themselves or somebody you know a loved one or a friend or something we'll have somebody up here after the service to pray with you so please come up and and receive that prayer and then also too if you miss any of the cds dvds we've got the last two weeks in the back so you can just uh, grab those but otherwise we can continue to you know make those up just see brian if there's a week or two or three or four that you've missed and uh, we can certainly get those uh, made up for you. So everybody just take a brief moment and uh, stretch your legs and wave to your fellow friends and loved ones and go with it. I was putting the video together from last week and I uh, realized I mentioned that I'm in the cone of silence here uh, with this thing. And I realized I was dating myself. <laughs> because because that's, a, that's from actually, that's from a, a situation comedy called Get Smart. Anybody remember that yes. from Jay yes. with John Adams? Well, the cone of silence was that thing that came down from the ceiling uh, when they wanted to talk in confidence, and it covered them, you know, it covered them up, and they talked in this in this uh, cone of silence. So that's where that's from. But you know, these things just kind of pop up in my head. I don't know why. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you and uh, praise you uh, for this day, Lord, and, and um, for the sunshine and uh, for your sunshine, Lord, the shining of your sun in our lives and our hearts. And we thank you and we praise you. And uh, uh, thank you, Lord. We'll, we'll, um, however, um, you healed Bill from, <laughs> from this virus, Lord, and, and uh, touched him and, and caused him not to get this. We're so thankful and praise you, give you the glory, Lord, yeah. and thank you. And God, just bless your word as we look in and, and um, teach us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Revelation chapter 18, if you have your Bibles. So we're in our study countdown to eternity as we continue to chip away at this book, winding down in it now. And um, uh, last time we finished chapter 17 as we saw the judgment on the religious aspect of Babylon the Great. Uh, Babylon the Great is the false religious system that has its origin in Babylon and has really infected every part of society and mankind. There are so many things uh, that we uh, use on a regular basis that come from Babylon. They're not bad in and of themselves, but they come all the way back from Babylon. Uh, for example, there's 60 seconds in a minute. Babylon. 60 minutes in an hour. Babylon. 360 degrees in a circle. Babylon. 360 days in a year. That was what it was originally. Babylon. That's the sun, that's earth, the earth revolving around the sun. That all comes back from Babylon. The days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, the names of those days, worshiping, the worship of uh, false gods, right? That all stems back to Babylon. So uh, many of the things, it's infected uh, society and we don't even uh, realize it. So um, John actually asked a question last week that I wanted to bring out today as we talked about the seven heads of the beast uh, representing the seven world kingdoms of history. John asked then, can these seven kingdoms also be referred to as the beast? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, in fact, when, when God talks about these kingdoms in the book of Daniel, he calls them beasts. And so the seven heads of the beast are these seven kingdoms. And so, yes, the seven kingdoms would be considered uh, the beast coming out and uh, uh, eventually being manifested in the Antichrist himself in that final uh, world uh, kingdom. So now we're... Uh, in chapter 18, part 3, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. And now we get to commercial Babylon. Chapter 17 was religious Babylon. Chapter 18 is commercial Babylon. And some scholars, some scholars see these two chapters, these two Babylons as the same, but just different aspects of it. However, there are some very distinct uh, differences in that. And if we look at the next slide, we can see uh, they're both called Babylon the Great, uh, but religious Babylon is called a harlot, commercial Babylon, a place of demons. Religious Babylon, identified with Rome, which is inland, uh, commercial Babylon is identified with a port city. Uh, religious Babylon is a woman, a prostitute, and a mother. Uh, commercial Babylon is a habitation, a great city, and a marketplace. Religious Babylon is guilty of religious abominations. Commercial Babylon, guilty of greed and self-indulgence. Religious Babylon is destroyed by a political power that previously supported her, the Antichrist. And commercial Babylon is destroyed by a sudden act of God. And so we'll see that as we uh, go get through and, and work through this uh, chapter. The woman in the city in chapter 17 was the religious Babylonian system, and the city of chapter 18 is the commercial Babylonian system. Religious Babylon will be judged toward the middle of the tribulation. Commercial Babylon will be judged toward the end. Now, will this religious and commercial Babylon be literal city power centers? I believe that's a possibility, especially from the language in both chapters. And there are many people who believe that the actual city of Babylon in Iraq will be rebuilt and the Antichrist will make it one of his headquarters. There are many people, uh, many scholars, uh, especially conservative scholars, who believe that uh, that's going to happen. And doesn't it make sense that Satan and the Antichrist would try to revitalize Babylon given its evil significance throughout history? I mean, doesn't that make sense? But always keep in mind, we're talking about this, that we're talking ultimately about the world system that Babylon has created, okay? So let's jump in, chapter 18, verse 1. And these things 
or I'm sorry, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and this earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, uh, mixed double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and I am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. So number one in your outlines, the system of this world will be destroyed. The system of this world will be destroyed. Verse one again. After these things... I saw another angel come down from heaven having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. It says, after these things, the Greek phrase metatauta, that, is a, that means that there's something new that God is showing us here. After these things, after what things? After the things of chapter 17. <laughs> after these things, after the destruction of religious Babylon, the harlot, there will be this destruction of this political and commercial Babylon in chapter 18. So after the true church is raptured out of all denominations on earth, there will emerge a one world religious system headed up by the false prophet, evidently from the city of Rome. We talked about that in chapter 17. And of course, this will play right into the Antichrist's hands. And we saw in chapter 17 this religious harlot riding the beast, thinking she can control the beast. She's in a dominant position over the beast. And, and, and yet, in reality, the beast is carrying her. See, she thinks she's riding the beast, but the beast is carrying her. Her. And this is what we see uh, today as well, folks. Religious groups think that they can control politicians when in reality, the politicians use religion to get what they want. And that's exactly what Antichrist is going to do. And so here in chapter 18, there's also going to emerge this political and commercial system of the Antichrist. In essence, this is the system of the world. When we say the world, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this Babylonian system that's all around us. And uh, Babylon the Great. And uh, this Babylonian system is going to be judged. So this world system as we know it today. Are you tracking with me? The system that as we know it today is going to be done away with. It's going to be done. It's going to be destroyed. Many people today are not only not saved, but they put their trust in a commercial and a political system that always fails. It always lets us down. It is idolatry, after all. But they're going to grieve when the system is judged because their lifestyles are no more. And we're going to see that later on, how they grieve over the destruction of this commercial 
system. And John says here, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. This is another angel of the same kind. In other words, this is not Jesus. This is another angel that we've just seen from chapter uh, 17, like the previous angels who poured out the bold judgments. And these are very powerful angels. You can see that in the text. And this could possibly be speaking of an archangel, like Michael. Or it could be speaking of Gabriel. We don't know. He's not mentioned by name. But this angel illuminates the earth with his glory in contrast to the darkness that comes over the Antichrist kingdom. So contrast there. When God gets involved, there's light. Verse 2. And he cried mightily with a loud voice. I always wonder about things like that. Is the earth going to be able to hear this? Are the people on the earth going to be able to hear this? Or why would he have to cry mightily with a loud voice in heaven? But yet he's doing it, and he's saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. So you can see from the language here that this sounds like an actual place that we're talking about, a literal commercial headquarters of this world system. And much of the language in chapter 18 um, does sound like it has uh, a literal uh, fulfillment and can also be found uh, in the prophets concerning literal Babylon. So the language that we hear in this chapter, you find in the prophets when they're talking about literal Babylon. Robert L. Thomas says this in his commentary. Ancient Babylon fell in 538 B.C., but this was not the ultimate fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. For John, this awaited a future consummation at the end of world history. And so many Bible teachers believe that this will be actual Babylon over there in Iraq, that somewhere along the line, the Antichrist is going to set up headquarters in that ancient city of Babylon. Doesn't mean it has to be totally rebuilt or anything, uh, but he, he, the, he'll set his sights on it. And it's an interesting theory, folks, because over there in chapter 17, remember, we talked about the false prophet being headquartered in Rome. And then we have the Antichrist here possibly being headquartered in Babylon. And that's interesting uh, because uh, um, uh, of uh, the cities involved, Rome and uh, Babylon. And I believe three cities are going to be in the sight of the Antichrist when he rises to power. And those three cities will be Rome. Uh, that's where the false prophet will be in the harlot headquarters. Jerusalem, because the temple is going to be rebuilt, and the image of the beast is going to be set up in the temple. And then Babylon, which is the origin of the world system in rebellion against God. And so Antichrist, I believe, will focus on those three particular uh, cities. All of this is considered Babylon the Great. Now, Babylon sat right on the Euphrates River, and it was a port city. Not an inland city, but a port city. And even though it was inland, it was still a port city because of the river. And so uh, that's going to come into play. We're going to see later on in this chapter. Saddam Hussein, uh, when he was alive, uh, for over 20 years, close to 25 years, uh, he was in the process of rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. He wanted to bring it to its glory again. He saw himself as the next Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, just uh, 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 boasting, you know, about the glory of Babylon kind of thing. Uh, but remember, 
This is where the Tower of Babel was. This is where the whole false system started under the rule of Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter of the souls of men in defiance of the Lord. And this mural here, this was of Nimrod, and this was found in Babylon, by the way. And the World Monuments Fund is determined to make Babylon a viable site on earth again. So that's in their sights. They're working on that. Now, remember, Nimrod made the Tower of Babel in defiance to the Lord in an attempt to reach up to the heavens. And they believe that, they, uh, that that is the site of the original Tower of Babel. And it looks like this uh, from the ground. And the stories go that when the tower was completed, that Nimrod went up to the top, took out his bow and arrow, and shot an arrow up at God, up into the heavens. In other words, I'm God now, God. And he's killing God, basically, in that uh, symbolic uh, gesture. So, we already talked about outside of the EU headquarters in Brussels, there is a statue of the woman riding the beast, and also the Winston Churchill building as well. There's a woman riding the beast there, and this is Europa riding Zeus. Europa is where Europe gets its name from, Europa. And so, but did you know that the EU Parliament is significant as well? Because the EU Parliament is the Tower of Babel, <laughs> rebuilt, basically. And it's modeled after the Tower of Babel. So you have the woman riding the beast outside the EU headquarters, and you have the EU Parliament building modeled after the Tower of Babel. It's so blatant and brazen, it would be humorous if it weren't so defiant. It's as if Nimrod is shooting his arrow at God again. Now, why is all this important? Because there are prophecies in the Bible that say Babylon is going to be destroyed. But I don't mean just destroyed. I mean completely and utterly wiped out to where it cannot be inhabited again like Sodom and Gomorrah. Anybody know where Sodom and Gomorrah are? No one knows, folks. They're gone, you see. And so that's how Babylon is going to be destroyed. And, uh, and that has not ever happened. It's desolate over there, but it has not happened yet. Saddam Hussein spent 25 years rebuilding it. He even stayed there at times. He built a palace there. Uh, people live in the vicinity of ancient Babylon right now as we speak. But look at Isaiah 13. It says, The burden against Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. And then we go down to verse 19. It says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew what? Sodom and Gomorrah. Watch this. It will never be inhabited nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. And so complete and utter destruction, no one even living in the area, no Arabian pitching his tent, his temporary tent there even. Jeremiah 50. Verse 13, because of the wrath of the Lord, she, Babylon, shall not be inhabited, but shall be wholly desolate. Everyone who goes by Babylon shall be horrified and hiss at all her plagues. Therefore, the wild beasts, uh, the wild desert beasts shall dwell there with the jackals and the ostriches shall dwell in it. It shall be inhabited no more. How long? Forever. Nor shall it dwell, uh, nor shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As, verse 40, as God overthrew, again, Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, 
says the Lord. So no one shall reside there, nor son of man dwell in it. Behold, the people shall come from the north, and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the ends of the earth. Chapter 51 of Jeremiah. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. Same language. The nations drank her wine. Same language as Revelation. Therefore, the nations are what? The nations are deranged because of Babylon, because of this Babylonian system. And verse 8, Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Uh, an instant destruction. So this Babylon the Great and its system has deranged the nations, the, the effects of this city and this system. And so these prophecies, as you can see, have not been fulfilled yet. Don't let anyone tell you that they have been. They have not. They're not reading it carefully. It is to be completely desolate, never to be inhabited again overthrown like Sodom and Gomorrah, which you cannot find right now. And yet today, Babylon is still inhabited. Uh, Thomas says this, until the present, Babylon has never undergone the destruction prophesied for her in the Old Testament. The present devastation of the region is the result of slow decay, not of sudden destruction. In fact, the site of Babylon of old has uh, been the location of a city of one type or another until very recent times. The prophecy thus indicates that before the advent of the warrior king in 1911 through 16, that's Jesus, Babylon will rise to its greatest height, not only of idolatry, chapter 17, but also luxury, chapter 18. Babylon of the future, therefore, will be the center of both false religion and world economic prosperity. So look at verse 2 again. <clears throat> Notice it says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Why, why the repetition? Why twice? It's probably because we're dealing with these two aspects of Babylon. Religious Babylon in chapter 17 and commercial Babylon in chapter 18. And notice that this is a dwelling place for demons. The, this Babylonian system is evil to its core, folks. A dwelling place of demons going back to its origins of Nimrod and Semiramis, who was, remember, a type of, a foreshadow of the Antichrist. Now, in verse 3, we're told why God is judging this system. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her, her luxury. So again, notice the global nature of this, right? Uh, the merchants of the earth, you know, the kings of the earth. This is global in nature. And notice the commercialism and materialism. The merchants of the earth, they become rich through the abundance of her luxury. The rich get richer. Don't they? <laughs> the powerful become more powerful. The world has become... As the Apostle uh, Paul said, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of good. The world loves pleasure more than it loves good. The atrocities that have been done and are being done in the name of pleasure and money are absolutely corrupt and disturbing. Very disturbing. Do you know that the richest 1% of Americans are close to surpassing all the wealth of the middle class? The richest 1% of Americans are close to surpassing all the wealth of the middle class. Eight, billionaire, eight billionaires from around the globe 
have as much money as the 3.6 billion people who make up the poorest half of the world's population. And according to CNN, the rich are still getting richer in the U.S. with the wealthiest 10% controlling 76% of all family wealth in the country. And CNN Money, the richest 10% of Americans now own 84% of all stocks. The gulf between the rich and the middle class is just growing and growing and growing. It's amazing. Number two, come out of her. Verse four, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And so God calls his people who turn to him during this tribulation period to come out of this world system because it's going to be judged and God is warning them lest they receive the plagues that are coming upon this system. And this is not the church that we're talking about here. The church is already in heaven, remember? But this sounds a lot like Lot, if you remember, in the Old Testament. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he warned Lot to get out first, come out of her. And Lot, Lot's wife still had her roots in the system, remember? And she wanted to go back. She turned and looked, remember that? And she turned into a pillar of? Right. And so this is not talking about the church, folks, but it is a transferable principle. I think we constantly need to evaluate ourselves of whether or not we're allowing ourselves to be consumed by this commercial system. It's all around us. And it is consuming. In fact, it's called consumerism, isn't it? John, the revelator, also writes in his epistle, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. <clears throat> but he who does the will of God abides forever. And so this is a big reminder and example of this. Uh, and uh, and we, we see... Uh, we actually see an example of this in this pandemic that we're going through right now. People's lives and lifestyles have been interrupted. And they don't like it, do they? I don't like it. Do you like it? <laughs> I don't like the interruption. There's anger. There's hopelessness. There's inconvenience. There's a lack of patience. How long is this going to go on? Do you know the 1918 flu pandemic lasted two years? Two years. They had two waves of it. And so we're seeing this going on when lifestyles are interrupted. People just become unglued, you know. And so this calling out by God of his people means that this system will be enticing them luring them in as Lot's wife was lured into Sodom. And how careful we need to be, folks. We need to be careful. We're Christians. We, we wear the name of Christ, you know. Verse 5. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. The sins of this city and worldly system have reached to heaven. And the word reached there in the original ancient Greek language literally means to glue. <laughs> to glue together. What this is saying is the sins of this Babylonian system have glued together, making this giant structure that's reaching up to heaven. That's what it's literally saying. 
And in that, folks, what may be alluded to is actually the bricks that they use to make the Tower of Babel and put it together in order to reach to heaven. Interesting, Nimrod tried to reach up to heaven with the Tower of Babel, but the only thing that reached up to heaven was their sins. And God remembers their iniquities. And this is why a relationship with Jesus is so important. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, God remembers your sins. If you do have a relationship with Christ, then our sins and lawless deeds he will remember no more. What side of that coin do you want to be on? So first, the system of the world will be destroyed. Second, God's people are called out of that system. And third, the system will get what it deserves. Verse 6, render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. Now, a better way to say that would be Give her double punishment for her double sins. That's really what it's saying. Give her double punishment for her double sins. In other words, the judgment that's coming on this world system will be exactly what it deserves. And this comes out more in the next uh, verse, verse 7. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. So notice her, the sins there, uh, pride, she glorified herself. Uh, she sits as a queen, uh, luxury, pleasure. She's no widow. In other words, I'm not gonna suffer. Isaiah prophesied this very same thing for Babylon. Isaiah 47, verse 8. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures, who dwell securely, who say in your heart, I am and there is no one else besides me. I shall not sit as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. Verse 9. But, those, but these two things shall come to you in a moment. Here it is again, sudden. In a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon you in their fullness because of the multitude of your sorceries. For the great abundance of your enchantments. The numbers of your sorceries, the abundance, the multitude abundance of your enchantments and what have you astrology babylon witchcraft comes from babylon horoscopes all have their roots in babylon and many other occult practices it it's all origined in babylon folks verse 8 therefore her plagues will come in what? That sounds literal to me, folks. And it keeps repeating it. Her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine. And she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And so, to me, it sounds like an instant devastation, uh, like um, nuclear, perhaps, or Sodom and Gomorrah style. God just rained fire from heaven all at once, but utterly burned and destroyed. And so, in an, in an instant, it's going to be done away with. But, but this chapter is a reminder that Material things are temporal. <laughs> Material things are going to burn. They're going to burn. And as Christians, we're not to buy into this Babylonian commercial system. Let's, let's close with a few verses. Matthew 6, 24. 
No one can serve two masters, for he, either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or the God of money, or the God of wealth. James 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. I wonder what Bill Gates thinks about a verse like that. Your gold and silver are corroded. That's interesting, don't you think? With all the push these days to buy silver and gold. Have you noticed that? The push to buy silver and gold. It says your gold and silver are corroded. They're not going to do you any good. If it crashes, it's all going to crash. And their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. James, boy, he just beats around the bush, doesn't he? 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Wow, isn't that the truth? And we've seen it over and over and over again. I mean, look at the interviews with people who have won the lottery and how they wish they had never won the lottery. And many of them have lost all of it. And wow, just one story after another, it's amazing what riches do. Riches Money makes people weird. It just gets people to act weird. It acts like a God, like it can control people. So you can't serve both God and money, right? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word in this chapter and the warnings and uh, all of it, Lord, the prophecies. And we pray that we would heed that now in our hearts, Lord, that you would change us, that that we would not buy into this commercial system that is all around us today. It, it drives the world. It's sickening at times. I pray that we would just step back and refocus our lives and our hearts and our eyes on you. Come out and be separate, your word says. Lord, help us to remember that. Come out and be separate, says the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And as we leave this place, I pray that we would be that example, that witness to the world around us. That we would show them the light of Jesus and the love of Jesus. And that you would give us opportunities to be a witness and be that witness to this world. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.